Wow. Great turnout. Great turnout. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Um, I am Carl Indefirth, holder of the uh, Wadwani Chair at U.S. India Policy Studies uh, here at CSIS. Very pleased to welcome all of you for this session on expanding U.S. trade markets, exploring LNG exports. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of interest uh, in this topic, um, as evidenced by this great turnout. So thank you all for being here, nice, bright and early, uh, for this discussion. Joining me here on the platform is our featured speaker, the Honorable Charles Bustany, the U.S. Representative from Louisiana's 3rd Congressional District. Uh, welcome, Congressman. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, please, let's... let's we start off, we need to sort of get ourselves pumped up for sure. Entirely <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> now, I should say to the Congressman, welcome back, because um, he was just here last month for another CSIS uh, event on U.S.-China uh, relations. So, um, thank you very much for a return engagement so quickly. Always happy to come back. Well, you don't say that. You'll be <laughs> every, every month for one event or another where you can contribute. Uh, also joining us on the platform is Sarah Landislaw. Sarah is the um, co-director and senior fellow uh, for the CSIS Energy and National Security Program. So Sarah, thank you. delighted to be doing this with you. In fact, some of you may be wondering um, why the U.S. India Chair is co-sponsoring today's event uh, with our energy program. Uh, the answer to that is very simple. Uh, to use the old expression, India has a very big dog in this fight. Uh, you might even say that uh, India's future depends on it, including its ability to put hundreds of millions of people, pull hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in India, uh, and to realize its ambitions to be a 21st century economic powerhouse. Energy is the key. Now, I trust you picked up on your way in a copy of a April op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that uh, India's ambassador to Washington, Neera Pomerao, wrote. Uh, it's entitled, India is Ready for U.S. Natural Gas. She writes in that piece that India is now the world's fifth largest energy consumer. Today it imports 75 percent of its energy, uh, especially oil and petroleum products, and expects to import 90 percent over the next decade. As a result, she says, India is working hard to diversify its energy supplies. Still, the demand for energy keeps growing in India at a 5 to 6 percent annual rate. All of this adds up, according to Ambassador Rao, to one very basic conclusion, namely that India must secure more energy supplies to further its social and economic development. And how might India do this? Happily, she says, this is her statement, happily, the U.S. has experienced a boom in the production of natural gas. So happily, that comment also provides us a perfect segue to hear the Congressman's remarks this morning. But first, a very brief introduction. Um, the Congressman's bio was available, also available as you came in. So I will not repeat it here, except to say that he was first elected to Congress in 2004, and he presently sits as a senior member of the powerful House Ways and Means Committee and on its Subcommittee on Trade. During his years in Congress, the Congressman has become a recognized leader on international trade and energy issues and health care reform. Um, Trade and energy, of course, are a natural fit for the Congressman since much of America's energy flows through South Louisiana. Healthcare is also a very natural fit since he is an MD with more than 30 years of clinical experience. So we now look forward, drawing on both that MD and his <laughs> uh, other experiences, to hearing his prescriptions uh, on, a, on U.S. trade and energy policy. I had to use that the prescription thing. <laughs> um, so, Congressman, the podium is yours. Yeah, when I first ran for Congress, I, uh, I, I outlined a platform called a Prescription for Prosperity. It, uh, <laughs> I, you know, sort of play on the doctor thing. But uh, exactly. I, uh, just to start off, my district in Louisiana 
is a coastal district. It runs from the Texas border uh, to the central coastal area of Louisiana, about an hour south of New Orleans. So it represents, I represent most of the coast of Louisiana. And it's an energy uh, working coast. And we're also the epicenter of what's happening in many respects with the natural gas world because the Henry Hub, which is the pricing point, is in my district. I have five out of the 18 or 19 LNG facilities, export facilities that are in the works located in my congressional district. And many, many of the companies that are engaged uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, exporting shale formations for oil and gas are in my district. Uh, in fact, there, when I fly back and forth between Louisiana and Washington, uh, typically many on the plane uh, from Houston, the leg from Houston to Lafayette, which is my hometown, are working in the energy sector. Some coming in uh, from international work, others working ar around the country. And of course, we've seen the, uh, all of the, the tremendous changes that have occurred because of new technology with hydraulic uh, fracturing and horizontal drilling. And I can tell you, having been to some of the manufacturing facilities that create this technology, it is truly space age. It's an amazing thing to see. And uh, it's, it, it also uh, makes one realize that manufacturing is still very much alive and well in the United States. Um, I've seen also that back in 2005, we, we had the creation or the construction of new LNG import facilities because we thought we were going to depend more and more on LNG imports. And I was, in fact, at the Sabine Pass facility in 2005 for its grand opening with uh, then Secretary Bodman, Secretary of Energy. And uh, it was anticipated that the U.S. would be importing more and more liquefied natural gas. And wow, that has really changed immensely uh, just in the last few years. And uh, energy markets have, have really changed immensely. So as I view this, there's a convergence of a number of, of events that I think are important to put this in perspective. One clearly is the major changes we're seeing in energy markets, not only energy markets in the US, but energy markets globally. Um, the, certainly North America, the US and Canada, have emerged as major producers. Uh, the shale, shale gas and now oil uh, opportunities have created export uh, potential for the United States, whether it's liquefied natural gas, refined product, and potentially even oil exports, which will, will be an interesting development depending on how this plays out. Um, we're seeing a lot of uncertainty in the Middle East, uh, traditional supplier of energy. Uh, this is changing daily in front of us. Uh, I don't think any of us really fully know where this is going to end up. Thirdly, uh, the United States has intensified its engagement in Asia, a welcome opportunity because of what's happening in Asia with growth, trade, and so forth. And of course, the big initiative is, is a Trans-Pacific Partnership. But with growth, uh, rising demand for energy in Asia, we're seeing that demand having major impacts on energy markets. Uh, so does this create resource nationalism and security problems? Or is there a way to solve this going forward? And I would submit that uh, if you look at all of these developments together, North America could emerge as one of the, uh, the great, um, uh, one of the great opportunities for exports into Asia to help fill that, that rising demand. Uh, provided we get policy correct here in the U.S. and there are a lot of challenges there. So how does this all fit in with India? And uh, you know, India is not in the TPP, so is India going to be on the periphery? We're talking about the second largest country in the world, a burgeoning democracy, a powerhouse potentially with regard to international trade, and I would submit that our, our trade relationship, the U.S. Uh, India trade relationship is underperforming. So th this creates a huge opportunity going forward. And this is where I think uh, liquef liquefied natural gas exports from the United States to India could play a major role. We saw an opening in the energy sector uh, in the Bush administration with the civil nuclear agreement. It so far has not reached the potential that uh, many of us thought and hoped for. But it was a great opening, <clears throat> a great opening with regard to moving forward our relationship, our bilateral relationship. 
But I do think that the export of liquefied natural gas o opens up many new opportunities uh, so that we could improve this trade relationship, break down some of the trade barriers, help, the U.S. could help provide uh, for the growing demand, and, uh, and I think we'll see tremendous benefit from all of that. So what, why is this important? Well, first of all, for the United States, the uh, natural gas revolution, LNG exports create jobs. I'm seeing it in my congressional district. Uh, a lot of investment ongoing. If you total up all the investment in one small city in, in Louisiana on the coast, Lake Charles, Louisiana, it totals up to about $50 billion in investment uh, in, in the natural gas sector. Some of it's uh, in the refining sector, some of it's uh, with the construction and hopeful potential exports of LNG. Uh, so we'll see pe uh, petrochemical exports. Now we're seeing this for the first time in quite some time, since the 40s. So jobs. But it helps with India. It helps India meet a rising demand. Uh, we, we know there are, what, some 300 million people in India who don't have electricity or have spotty electricity. Um, India is str struggling with this vulnerability, this huge vulnerability uh, that, that poses barriers to its growth. And so I do think with, you know, that starting this process of LNG exports is critical. Uh, I, I also think it's a time-limited opportunity for U.S. companies. As other shale formations come online, uh, as some of the geological limitations, infrastructure limitations, perhaps in Australia, other places come online, this creates, um, you know, this is an opportunity that's time-limited limit, for U.S. companies. Uh, it, this will certainly help the U.S. trade imbalance that we're seeing uh, if we can export energy products uh, we will see a, a marked improvement because the biggest factor in our trade imbalance is with energy. And so we're seeing that shift. And more broadly, exports, by creating this new opportunity, will help, I think, uh, stimulate further natural gas exploration production in the United States at a time when the price is very, very low. And we're seeing some of the production efforts shifting back to oil because of the price situation. But the United States has this tremendous opportunity because it, I mentioned it's time limited, but we, we're the only country right now where we're seeing this delinkage of gas prices from the price of oil uh, with this pricing at Henry Hub. Canada's not even enjoying that type of advantage, but Canada's rushing forward to, to build pipelines to get gas to the Pacific coast. So What's going to happen is, I think, if we can see integration of energy markets in North America, closely integrating the U.S. and Canadian markets uh, to meet this demand in Asia, this, this meets what I would call a U.S. vision of energy security, open markets, rather than uh, pipeline diplomacy uh, and resource nationalism, the, the types of things that uh, um, you know, we're concerned about, an alternative view of energy security. So LNG exports, let me close out by saying LNG exports create an opening for a, a more intensified, integrated U.S.-India relationship. Uh, it will help, I believe, in the broader trade arena as we go forward. Um, it will help strengthen the security relationship between our two countries in an area where security concerns are growing, where economic growth is occurring, where much of the world's trade is occurring. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to push for it. And uh, with that context, uh, I'll certainly be happy to answer any questions going forward. Thank you. Great context. Sarah, do you want to comment, make yeah. some remarks, and then maybe pose a first opening question? Sure. Sounds like a great plan. I, I just wanted to mm. say thank you very much, Ambassador Nderfirth, for having me here today with uh, Congressman Bustani. It's a real uh, pleasure to be able to do this event together. Uh, as I was telling uh, uh, both the ambassador and the congressman before our session, you know, the energy program here at CSIS has been focusing a great deal on this issue because it is one that people are so intensely interested in, not only from an Indian perspective, but also from the EU or Japan or any other country out there that's fundamentally interested in what having the United States as a net exporter of any energy product uh, over a long uh, uh, time frame uh, means for them in a strategic sense and how that will affect markets. And so um, 
one of the things I thought I would do is, is you know, understanding and, and thinking everything that you've said is so reasonable about uh, and, and sound about the reasons why LNG exports make a lot of sense is ask the really obvious question about um, why is it so hard then, right? Why has it been so hard up until this point? Why are people surprised at the level of delay that we've seen in the U.S. permitting process for these projects? And maybe just throw out a few ideas and, and get your, you know, your ideas about whether or not those are kind of on target. Uh, I think first and foremost, the thing that's, that I, you know, I usually tell people when, uh, when visiting from abroad is, is you know, this is a fundamental shift for the United States that took even the largest energy companies in the world by surprise, right? Uh, it, it's a function of, uh, of the, the sort of regulatory environment, commercial framework environment that we have here in the United States. And it's one of these wonderful things where, you know, the combination of technologies and resources we knew were always there surprised everybody. And so there was a natural sort of skepticism looking at the unconventional gas revolution and saying, is it real? Is it sustainable? And when we started to find tide oil resources and funny things started to happen in terms of where people were moving rigs, people got even more curious about whether or not this is here to stay. We still get this question today. And I think that's part of the, the concern over whether we'd be exporting large amounts of LNG is, gee, are we going to be able to continue to produce at this rate? Or is it somehow uh, not a, a, a permanent uh, trend? The second, it was just sort of a change in psychology. you know, and, and we have, for the last 40 years, been a country whose energy policy is predicated on the idea that we are a growing energy consumer and we are resource constrained, even though we're a resource abundant country and always have been, right? And so this idea that that wasn't going to be the situation going forward requires people to sort of take that on board and say, well, what does that mean for us? And when you couple that with the third element, which is the pressure that was coming from lots of places around the world saying, well, what's the U.S. going to do with this resource to be strategic about it? Will there be an industrial policy? Will they you know, be more resource nationalistic, keep it at home, try and create economic competitive advantage? Will they direct exports to countries with whom they have a security relationship or, or some sort of strategic uh, objective? Um, I, I think it takes people a while to sort of think through some of those questions. Uh, finally, there was some legitimate sort of environmental concern, right? I mean, people were looking at unconventional resource uh, uh, development and still are and saying, gee, how do we do this at scale at a level we've never done before and give the public confidence that, you know, that, that it can be done safely? And there's, you know, reams of people uh, out there in, in the commercial and private uh, uh, and public sector trying to grapple with that question. But Fundamentally, lots of folks wondering whether or not we were going to find our way through that, you know, can this be done safely uh, 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 question. Uh, and then fi finally, you, you, you talked about sort of the dynamism in global energy markets. It, these have not been an uneventful 15 years we've just gone through, right? I mean, there have been fundamental shifts in the global energy landscape, and it and it requires a lot of people to look at those shifts and say, how would the U.S. exporting LNG shape global gas markets, right? What does that do to sort of the price differentiation in different places and even between different fuels and things like that? So it required a bit of study. All of this is not to be uh, uh, defensive of the amount of time that we've taken to do it, but it is to recognize that this is a shift in, in who and what we've been in energy terms. And one of the reasons why I was really heartened to hear your remarks in particular is, you know, fundamentally the United States has been one of those countries that's been out there for the last several decades that, that has argued that integrated trade and global energy markets and diversity in those markets, not only in terms of suppliers but also in terms of fuels, is the core of what makes energy security. And for us to have a significant departure from that, uh, from, from that sort of energy policy mentality I think would be uh, uh, a, a real sort of departure that, that countries around the world would, would find uh, difficult. So, so I guess my opening question would be sort of given that sort of cathartic public policy process we've all been going through over the last you know, couple of years, how do you see this process moving forward? Do you think there's a common understanding about the strategic good that you see 
uh, for LNG exports uh, from for sort of a broader energy and international energy policy sense? Well, I think there's a, a, we, we need to really embark on an education process, members of Congress and others, the, the American public in general. If you think about where we were and where we, where we are now, just in a matter of decades, we've gone from lines at the gasoline pump uh, to uh, a, a point in time where we thought we were going to be increasing our imports of natural gas. We were certainly heavily dependent on imports of oil to a point now where we're looking to make that shift where we can now export some natural gas. We have a large abundance of natural gas and it's, this looks like it's going to play out over time. Um, uh, we're exporting you know, refined products yeah. and we potentially could export oil depending on what happens with all this. But we have to bring the public along on this and that there, there are going to be some challenges because there's a mindset in the U.S. that we've been dependent on energy and it's, you know, it's about American security. But I, I firmly believe that our view of energy security should be diversification and sources of fuel diversification uh, in the, um, the types of fuels and, and sources of energy as well. That's an American view of energy security and I think we can play that role out if we get the policies correct. Uh, there are some who want to take this and use it purely in a, you know, a traditional national security type of arrangement. In other words, export gas only to NATO countries or NATO plus Japan. And I don't think that's the right approach. I think that sort of certainly violates the, the spirit of, uh, of our World Trade Organization obligations. But at the same time, I think it runs counter to our view uh, of what energy security should really be. And I think we have to have that discussion. What, you know, based on the, the supply that we have and our position in the world, what are the implications of an open energy market, integrated energy markets, and how does that dovetail with trade? Um, and it, it struck me that energy over, really since the, the 50s and 60s, has sort of evolved separately uh, as a, whether it's oil or gas and they're different markets, so it's evolved separately from the framework of trade, and we need to see more convergence in that, I think, in the long run. Mm -hmm. So those are just some of my initial views on, on that question. Could I just follow up s with something that Sarah raised in terms of uh, the, the timing for when this could actually begin? Um, I was in Japan in May when DOE announced its latest uh, made its latest announcement regarding non-FTA countries and the possibility of exporting. Uh, the Japanese were very excited, uh, and I was happened to be there with uh, it was a Jap Japan, India, U.S. trilateral discussions. The Indians were as excited about it as the Japanese <laughs> were. Saying, okay, the you know the green light is flashing now. But in terms of how long it will take to get from where we are today with with the the green light flashing to when we will actually be able to do this, I mean right. all of the licensing and all of the uh, infrastructure issues, when can this actually s take place if we're going to do it? Well, the uh, one company has received the, uh, the Department of Energy license and, uh, and has gone through the process and it's anticipated, I think, sometime in 20, early 2015 that they could actually export the first, uh, first uh, amount of gas to, to countries or entities that have locked in 20-year contracts. That company does have a 20-year contract with Gale. Um, I can't recall the, the volume of gas right offhand that they're going to export uh, to Gale, but that's in place. And a second facility has just received the, the green light uh, just over the, the Louisiana-Texas border in, in Texas. And we're waiting to see what's going to happen with the Department of Energy. In fact, I know I've written letters to the department trying to get a sense of their timeline, wh what's holding all this up. Uh, we just yesterday passed an energy and water appropriations bill and there's language in the bill that, that uh, asks the Department of Energy to show us you know, why they're delaying this and how could this be expedited, lay out the process so there's more certainty going forward. But regulatory uncertainty in all of this uh, and you know, whether it's on the permitting side or <coughs> regulations dealing with hydraulic fracturing and, and, um, and, and horizontal drilling create, basically pose an unknown for how, how, how quickly this will develop. Mm -hmm. And so 
working through those regulatory uncertainties is going to be critical. You know, a couple of key factors. Uh, right now, regulation is done at the state level, and some states have embraced this. Others have basically resisted it. Some are cautiously looking at it. Um, the, the, the uncertainty about permitting is, is another consideration. And so uh, we're hopeful that the newly seated energy secretary will move forward with this, and, uh, and, let, and let's, let's see what happens. I think realistically out of the 18 or 19 or so uh, uh, facilities that are, or companies that are looking to do this, realistically five, maybe six of them will get the permits. So we're still talking about a, a relatively limited amount of gas in the grand scheme of, of uh, American uh, natural gas production. Uh, a small amount being exported, but I, I do think that it's, it's going to have a, a very disproportionate impact on gas markets and on the geopolitics of this. And so I think it's critically important for the U.S. in terms of its trade policy, energy policy, its view of, uh, of energy security. Yeah. Interesting. <coughs> uh, Secretary Kerry was just in India on June 24th for his first engagement with the Indian government in what's called the U.S.-India Strategic Dialogue. He took uh, a number of key administration officials with him, including the new energy secretary. And Stephen Chu had been in India just uh, about three months earlier. So the Indians are very much engaged on trying to work through these things, including the strategic implications of what we'll be doing together. So, well, let's, let's open this up. We've got a, a great audience. Um, it is a diversified, we're talking about diversity here. This is a diversified <laughs> audience. We've got think tanks, we've got industry representatives, we have members of the press, everything is on the record. Is that That's correct. okay? We need to just stipulate that. Um, and I would like to ask you, I will try to sort of find people at different parts of the room. I um, would like you to identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, and we will then uh, be able to engage in this for about uh, 45 minutes. So. Hope we've got plenty of questions, and we're going to shoot right to the back. This gentleman standing up here who's probably near a microphone. Microphone will come over, and we'll get the ball rolling. Hi. Thanks for, thanks for uh, your fantastic remarks. Um, Alexander Sullivan from the Center for New American Security. Um, one thing that I've heard in regards to the LNG export facilities, uh, especially those that were originally, originally created for importing um, LNG and quite obviously are not going to be used for that purpose, uh, you know, uh, in any substantial way in the future, is that they can be retooled um, to export quite easily. Um, but, you know, that if we wait five years, let's say, to get this policy right to start, you know, um, issuing permits and, and, and licenses um, expeditiously, that a lot of these facilities are going to have to shut down um, due to sort of underuse, more or less, um, and that it would be quite difficult. Um, technically speaking, to restart them or to, you know, uh, invest the capital expenditure to build new ones or, or what have you. Are you hearing any of this from those in your um, constituency who, who are engaged in this business? Well, this is a concern. Uh, many of these were built at a time when we thought we were going to have to import gas. And so there, there is new construction that has to be put, uh, you, know, you know, gone through to refit them to export. Um, First, you have the DOE license, and then you have FERC licensure, which is expensive. Uh, it's an expensive proposition, runs in the millions of dollars. Uh, and then to build, just to retrofit, you're talking about two to five billion dollars in investment, uh, the construction time. So all those things are factors. And we're seeing such a rapid shift in energy markets today that this is time limited, I believe, for the US. How much time? It's, it's, you know, it's, you know, is it five years? Is it a little longer? Is it less? Remains to be seen. But we do know that other, you know, obviously in the Middle East you have Qatar, which is a very large gas exporter. There's Iranian gas, uh, Russians. These are, but, but this is all within a traditional model uh, of, uh, for gas markets. But I do think we're going to see a con uh, others, others coming online. I mean, there, there was a look at Poland recently. It didn't pan out. I know uh, Brazil has some um, unconventional gas reserves. They're very interested in trying to look at that. Obviously, Australia is a big player. But they're going to have to build out infrastructure in all of those cases, Canada as well, to get gas out uh, for export to the Pacific. 
So there's a race in effect. How long does the, the pricing mm -hmm. differential uh, with this delinkage at the Henry Hub last? Is there going to be a convergence of pricing globally? Uh, right now we have basically three different price regimes. Uh, there's an Asian price regime, European, and then the Henry Hub pricing. How long does all that last? There are a number of moving parts. My position is let's expedite the permit permitting so that these facilities can be refitted or constructed uh, and let's, let's move on with it because what are the benefits? We reduce our trade deficit. We create U.S. jobs. Uh, in fact, one of the bright spots in this sluggish U.S. economy has been in the energy sector where we've seen employment growing as a result of this. And I can tell you I was very fearful when the moratorium in the Gulf of Mexico was imposed after the uh, Deepwater Horizon event. I thought my district was going to, and my state was going to see a serious uh, rise in unemployment. And the only reason it did not happen was that we saw a shift, uh, because the timing just happened to be fortuitous, we saw this shift into unconventional oil and gas. And a lot of these companies shifted. So I, the point I'm making, I guess, in, in general terms is this is time limited. We have to get our policy in place so we can move forward because it's a win-win for, for the U.S. and for those partners uh, around the world that, that partner with us, such as India. That's good. Do you want to say? Uh, yeah, I guess just to add, I mean, I think that there's, so there's a hierarchy of projects here in the U.S., right? I mean, commercial speculation is that projects that have to retool, which is more expensive and complicated than retooling sounds, um, uh, have a good sort of shot at being able to uh, to sort of get through the regulatory and, and sort of commercial hurdles that you need to be able to be an export project um, more than sort of say building a new sort of greenfield facility somewhere or building a, a facility in a place that's not really co-located with one of these new production centers here in, in, in the U.S. But that time limitation really comes from the capa LNG export capacity that's coming online around the world, which is already sort of in its own investment cycle. And so, I mean, I think one of the big questions here is, you know, how do you, how do you construct a permitting process that allows the commercial and, you know, entities in the market to decide which of those projects have options about, you know, what they're going to do and how they're going to weather, you know, a very, very dynamic global gas trade situation uh, and, and uh, versus sort of hold that up and try and, and presuppose what those decisions for those companies are going to be. And so I think that that's sort of a, no one can assume what the commercial decisions of any one of those companies or facilities is going to be. They have options. They're part of companies that have baskets of, you know, suites of, 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 uh, of projects and, and portfolios, so they make decisions based on that. Um, but uh, I think that, that trying to sort of divorce a regulatory process from those types of commercial decisions is probably in our best interest. Good. Questions? Uh, let's stay in the back here. This gentleman here. Please. And there's the mic. Uh, I'm Eric Swenson. I'm a partner with Fulbright and Jaworski. We do a lot of the work for projects that are um, seeking or have the export uh, authorizations and also customers of the terminals. Uh, the congressman's comment that he thought only five or six uh, projects would get permitted uh, I just was wondering if we get some clarification on that, whether he feels it's the DOE that's going to actually put the brakes on permitting or whether you're, you're really uh, looking at it from a commercial standpoint and there's only a market that will support five or six or timing issues, but, but not a government clamping down on the, on the exports itself. Yeah, th that comment is largely spec uh, speculation on my part. I don't think it's because of a limitation on the permitting uh, process. I just think it's going to be infrastructure limited you know, in terms of where do you have pipelines, access to gas, uh, access to uh, uh, water, deep water to ship it out, those kinds of things. Um, and then just it's cost prohibitive. It's a, it's a big capital investment. And so if you take all those things together, um, will all 18 or 19 or 20 facilities that are take, you know, giving this consideration really go through the expense of doing it? Um, given that there may be some pipeline limitations and other things. Um, so it's anybody's guess, and, and Sarah may have more concrete data on that. I, I don't know if, if there's... No, I mean, I think that, so the, the, the sort of, the 
commercial and or infrastructure reality of how much of this is going to get permit has been the name of the game for the last several or last couple of years, right? I mean, how much do we think would leave if we permitted all of the projects that wanted? You know, it's not going to be 30 BCF, right? So it's, what is it going to be, right? And most of the conventional wisdom is six to eight. Um, and people are afraid that, that, uh, that that's not true or there would be a domestic impact impact if it, if, it, if it was more than that or if the supply base in the United States didn't respond. And so we, that's what the EIA and NERA and all of those other groups have been studying for the last uh, couple of years. But now the big question has sort of shifted in that we seem to have concluded that we think the general macroeconomic benefits of LNG exports to the United States are good for most, not great for all, but good for most in terms of economic terms. Uh, the question is, does the does DOE eventually end up permitting all of the permits in the queue? And how long would that take? And there was a letter from your colleagues in the Senate yesterday that basically asserted at, at a six to eight week pace for every permit going forward, uh, you, would, you would be on a two year time frame to get through that list. Uh, if you stop that list early uh, and you don't permit all of those projects, what do the people who didn't get a permit feel about that and what is their recourse for uh, uh, talking to the government about that. Uh, so I, I think that the, the answer to the question of will there be a pause or will there be a stoppage at some point on the number of permits that uh, non-FTA uh, export permits that the, that the Department of Energy puts out uh, is it, still very much an open question but has sort of moved to how quickly will you get those permits out because de facto if you don't get them out fast enough are you uh, uh, not allowing for uh, for those those projects to have a commercial chance, whether you think they do or not. Okay, um, in the in the center here, um, this gentleman. Yes. Hi, I'm Michael Ivey with uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries America. You mentioned the petrochemical industry uh, briefly, and I believe the number that the American Chemistry Council throws out is seventy billion dollars. Uh, in planned investment in uh, chemical infrastructure uh, scheduled in the United States in the next few years. But that is kind of dependent on having a low-priced feedstock. And there's going to get to a, a certain price level where people simply aren't going to pull the trigger on these large investments. So when you're talking to your constituents, some of which probably very supportive of LNG exports, and you're talking to your constituents in the chemical industry. How do you balance those two uh, interest groups? And uh, is there uh, a point where we can get these parties around the table to agree? I do think we'll get to a point of agreement on this. Um, I know from a chemical industry perspective, there are concerns about whether we'll see price volatility or ri you know, rising prices that then really hurt profit margins, export capacity for the petrochemical industry. Um, I don't think the amount of gas that's going to be exported will have that kind of impact on the pricing. I think we're going to see price stabilization. Uh, and likely what would happen is, uh, and this is again based on everything I've read, we'll see a convergence. We may see a small uptick in the pricing of gas, but at the level of pricing now, and over the last several months, it, it really has not even been cost effective to drill. And so we've seen a lot of companies that, that do exploration production backing away, shifting to oil. And so we're not at maximum production of gas right now. So I think you can hit the sweet spot where a price stabilizes, where it's profitable for the chemical industry. Uh, it's profitable to ship gas and it's, and it's a win-win for the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, uh, part of it is going to be with the limitation. I mean, there's going to be an economic limitation as to how many of these companies export. Uh, economics is going to dictate it. But I think if you try to micromanage it uh, with some sort of industrial policy, I don't think that's, that's the right way to do it. I mean, we, we should em embrace open trade, let the markets sort of, you know, work in all this. But I think we'll hit a sweet spot. Gentlemen, right here. This gentleman here in the third row, and then we'll come to the first row. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, David Lewis with Manchester Trade. We're export advisors to Sabine Pash and your energy. So thank you for your support, Congressman. I'm interested in uh, medium long term. Obviously, the short term snafu with regulation permits 
has something to do with the fact that it's about two, three generations old in terms of regulations and legislation. The Natural, National Gas Act is from the 1930s, so we're sort of with a 21st century market model technology and 19th century regulations on this. Is, what's the discussion with you and your colleagues in Congress now about eventually when do we upgrade and modernize mm -hmm. our National Gas Act and how this is going to affect the future? Thank you. That's a really important question. It's something I've been given consideration to. I don't know if other members of Congress are thinking about this just yet, but uh, under the Natural Gas Act, there, there are a couple of quali qualifications for that would allow exports. Obviously, if we have a free trade agreement, um, it's allowed. In, in countries without a, uh, without a free trade agreement with the United States, then this is where the new permitting process comes into play with the Department of Energy. And the requirement there is basically, is it in the, in the, in the public interest, the national interest? Um, do we need to define that better legislatively in statute is something I'm curious about. I'd like to consult with a lot of experts on that and try to think through the ramifications because you don't want to tinker with something and create, create problems that you don't foresee on, on the front end. So um, I think we might need to look at this in the long run. But um, so far, I mean, aside from just the, the delay in the permitting, the process seems to be working under current law. But I would certainly entertain any expert, you know, expert advice uh, as to, you know, whether this needs to be adjusted. I don't know, Sarah, if you have I, I, on this. I have a sense of a CSIS project in the <laughs> making here. Uh -huh. I just got a sense here, Sarah. What do, what do you, you think? You know, I mean, it, David, it's a great, uh, it's a great comment. I mean, I think that one of the things that is is increasingly clear on a number of fronts vis-a-vis uh, -vis U.S. energy policy is that a lot of it was predicated on old policies, but then updated a long time ago, right? And so we have a lot of different things that, uh, that we need to look at and say, gee, if we're, you know, if we're a net energy exporter, you know, in the longer run, um, how do we think about the SPR? How do we think about, you know, uh, how we, we govern uh, infrastructure projects that are cross-border or export licenses? How do we sort of think about these things? And I think you're right. You know, once upon a time, it was a, a, a sort of a binary world, right? Trade relationships were between two countries, and you had a fairly straightforward relationship with them on a variety of trade fronts. I mean, one of the things that's exceptionally complicated that the congressman alluded to earlier is, you know, we're one of the largest petroleum product exporters in the world, right? And, and which, which, you know, political person among us likes to explain to the average consumer about, you know, why they pay what they pay, at, you know, domestically when we've got all this new, you know, oil and, and, and gasoline and diesel and, and this sort of energy abundance mantra, right? It's not, uh, I and, you know, as, as people who, who look at the counterfactuals often tell me, you know, if we weren't producing what we're producing today, you'd be paying a heck of a lot more. So, but, you know, that's always a hard thing to sort of, you know, convey to the public. And so, I, I think that the real tricky thing is 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 the the sort of common sense things you would do to fix it, right? Like say, so what is the national interest, right? How would you define that? Well, spend spend a couple of days trying to do that, and, <laughs> and and then put your political hat on and see if you would ever allow that kind of clarity into what is essentially a national security policy making process, right? Which is essentially. If we deem this to be against the public interest, we hold it within our sovereign right to do something about it. Who's going to give that up? Not a lot of people, right? So the question is, and maybe maybe I'm wrong, right? I've never run for an office, so. Uh, but, but the question is, how do you put clarity in the investment process mm -hmm. while sort of maintaining what any and all government probably wants to hold over its natural resources, right? Because there is something different about energy if we admit it to ourselves, right? We think about it in sort of different sort of national security terms, even though it's a basic commodity like a lot of other things. It has a, a security angle and a strategic angle. Until that changes, the question is how do we, how do we put a, a process between ourselves and the export process or any other sort of policy decision making that, that sort of puts some room between the politics of the process and, and the regulatory structures so people don't feel like 
gee, I know I can get my safety permit, and I know I can get the commercial aspects of the deal and the financing done. I just don't know when it goes into this black box whether it's ever, ever coming out the other side, right? And so putting some detail around what that process is, what the public you know, hearing process would be, I think is maybe the area where you get compromise on those kinds of things until we're a little bit further into the shift and maybe we'll feel more comfortable about, uh, about how we deal with those national interest decision-making processes. Okay. In the front here, um, front here. And then we're going to swing around to this side. Yeah. <laughs> coming, coming that direction. It's a challenge to get everybody. It, it is. It is. My name is Asmok Shah from Business Times. First of all, I congratulate the CSIS for organizing such thought provoking symposium, which is not only the national security, but for international affairs. And Ambassador Carver, Mr. Emderberg, recently, just now we mentioned about the India-US strategic dialogue in which Secretary Kerry laid a big mission in India. And about that, U.S. government and the Indian government are uh, attaching great importance to the energy security, not only for the energy itself, but for the national security of both the countries. And that is one of the highest priority given by both the countries. With this, in this regard, just a few days back, I had a talk with India's Minister for Petroleum Gas. And I know this, how things are moving on in this direction. This week, actually tomorrow, there's a going to be a big meeting in USIBC leadership conference. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a conference on this US India CEO forum on Friday. So all this is shows that there's a great opportunity for cooperation between India and USA, especially the energy sector. And about that thing, both countries are keen, but because still US has not given the permission to start exporting because of FDA, uh, these free trade agreements. So as you mentioned it, what are the prospects you look for this fast export of U.S. natural gas to India? And another thing is that Indian business people, private sector is so much interested in investing in America. And they have already started it. And this will, will encourage Indian business people to invest into manufacturing activities in America, which would create a, so many big jobs. Today, 100,000 jobs are created by Indian investments about $10 billion, which can go up to any amount. So I would appreciate if you can highlight about this India your business relationship in energy sector. Thank you. Well, I think uh, LNG exports to India uh, as this gets started could certainly be a, a strong facilitator of greater integration uh, investment between the two countries. Uh, also, um, bilateral trade, which is growing, but could grow at a faster rate. Um, I, there are other things that need to happen, obviously. I, I think uh, we need to move forward with the bilateral investment treaty. I think that's really important. I think um, there's uh, an international trade and services agreement that's out there through WTO. This, I think if this were uh, something that India were to embrace, it could help facilitate trade and services, which would I, I think would really jumpstart bilateral investment uh, between our two countries. Um, I think the, the absence of, of those things, a bilateral investment treaty and you know, some agreement in, on how to deal with services is critically important. Uh, U.S. companies are still concerned about intellectual property protections and you know, some of these other issues, forced localization. These are barriers that we have to work through, but I, I think uh, there are vehicles to do it, and I do think you know this this initial step with LNG exports certainly would be a, a prime facilitator of, of greater integration. India is already doing a great deal of investing in U.S. terminals, right? That's right. Yeah. So there's that element. With Louisiana and your energy experts, I mean the whole question of focusing on exporting energy is one element, but is there any exchange that? possibility of exchange of technology and expertise with with India. Can, can Louisiana develop that kind of relationship as well? Because India also is interested in its own domestic development. Uh, no, I think that's a, that's a great question. And we have, for instance, in the energy sector, we have a, a number of small energy companies. Uh, some of them are into manufacturing 
uh, the, the, the equipment, the, uh, all the, uh, the tools and things that are done in the energy sector. These companies are, would be happy to, to partner with, uh, with Indian companies, uh, whether it's to enhance uh, exploration and production in India or you know, bilateral investment uh, with Indian investment back in the U.S. I think any and all farms would be welcome. But we're going to have to get to some steps uh, or take some steps with regard to how do we integrate these services? How is it, you know, is there a fair framework? Uh, that's why I do think the, uh, the uh, International Services Agreement is a good, would be a good vehicle for Indi the Indian government to consider, mm -hmm. uh, as would a bilateral investment treaty, which takes both sides to, you know, to come to an agreement on. But I think that's a gr there's a, there is tremendous opportunity uh, between the two countries, between companies in the two countries to do this. Good. The gentleman here, yes. Right in the second row. All very good questions, and uh, 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 the point about ex uh, expediting this process is something I fully support. I think uh, this is a good good move for the United States and for U.S. companies. So I would like to see these permits in place, and let's let this market play out. Uh, what we've seen in gas markets is um, uh, certainly from very isolated, segmented market to regionalization. Uh, we've, of course, seen how the Russians and others have conducted themselves with this, using it for uh, gas for political purposes. Uh, it's, it's a very healthy uh, change in the market to have U.S. companies through open contracts, open markets, uh, conducting this type of work. Would there be competition with, um, perhaps with Qatar and other countries? Yes, possibly. Uh, they'll be, um, it'll be based on price. And I think uh, th that, that would be a healthy development. But sort of uh, underlying all of that is the grave uncertainty we're seeing in the Middle East right now, politically. Uh, we don't know, I don't think any of us know how this will play out. Will it affect the Gulf states in the near future? Uh, that's, there's uncertainty. And so having diversification of supply I think is very important. And so it's, and it's not just India. I mean, you know, these companies are working out 20-year contracts with Japan and other countries, yeah. and it will be open. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good, that's, that's, I think, an American view of energy security that's mutually beneficial. Sarah, do you want to um, uh, address that issue of, with the U.S. as an energy producer, uh, how this is going, uh, the relationship with other energy producers? What's, sure, what's, yeah. I mean, this is a new development. How is this going to play out? Yeah, I think that it, you know, it's obviously a, a, a complicated question, but, but one of the things that, that's important to remember is that so the, the U.S. unconventional oil and gas revolution has, has already sort of shifted the energy landscape, right? So, so by, by taking the United States out of the net importer status for gas, you have gas that was traditionally projected to come to the United States going other places, right? And that adds 
new market entrants, new diversity, perhaps some you know, uh, contract leverage in certain places around the world in terms of, uh, of other places that we're looking you know, uh, to, to be importing gas from new places, right? So, so by virtue of the fact that the United States is no longer has that gigantic sucking sound you know, of energy coming to the United States all, all the time from around the world, that has sort of shifted markets in some fundamental ways. The second thing that you alluded to that I think is really important and, and uh, to remember is we are not the only place around the world that has these resources, and people are thinking strategically about how to develop their own. I, several months back, we hosted Minister Naimi, the Saudi Arabian oil minister, and he basically said, I'm really glad you have a lot of unconventional oil and gas. Um, we do, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so they're starting to look at producing unconventional shale gas in, in Saudi Arabia, which is certainly you know, going to be an interesting development for their own sort of domestic energy needs as well. India is doing the same. Places like China doing the same. Argentina, Brazil. You're starting to see this. You know, Mexico. All over, uh, all over the world, people reevaluating their own resource base. So it's given this level of resource optimism that is, is causing people to, as you say, sort of look at their own strategic energy platform and say, gosh, how has this changed for us? Is it a more competitive international environment? Or is it, and how do our, do our own domestic resource production strategies sort of fit into that? And so it's a very sort of strategic and dynamic landscape in that way. I would, though, caution that they're not all producer countries are the same, right? Some of them have a very sort of mature and responsive uh, uh, and flexible uh, uh, production outlook where they can respond to a lot of different you know, global market environments depending on how they run their own sector, and others don't have as much flexibility. But compared to you know five, six years ago, when we were just looking for how on earth we were going to be replacing all of the energy resources that we need you know, to meet future demand to one right now where you know, we have a global outlook that seems a little bit more well supplied, um, it, it doesn't necessarily directly link to a, a confrontational environment. Right? There's just a lot more room for thinking about strategically how to work together on issues like this. Yes, sir. I'm on the side here. <laughs> it's uh, Dana Marshall with, <coughs> pardon me, Transnational Strategy Group. Thank you, Rick, for organizing this. I wanted to uh, see if I could um, explore a different angle that we haven't talked about much, but I do think is um, is important in this discussion, and that is the sort of the the political and economic connections. Uh, that we're talking about here, specifically this. The President, over the last couple of weeks, has come out with both a climate action plan and a Power Africa plan, both of which, of course, have important implications for gas, important implications for the politics of coal in the United States and abroad versus gas. I wonder, Congressman, if you might be able to speak, also Sarah, obviously, but on, the, the, on how the, the politics of this nets out. Uh, is if, if a war, if, if what the president is suggesting is a war on coal or a war on Wyoming, is it an ally, is he allying with Louisiana? I, I mean, I, of course I'm joking with that, but I just, but, but the politics are obviously very important. The political sort of, and the economic implications of this uh, domestically on the action plan and for example on the potential of putting American LNG into Africa. Uh, for power and to reduce environmental concerns? Well, I, I don't know uh, what the details are yet of the President's plan for Africa. We, you know, I haven't seen any detail as to how that would be done, how it would be funded, uh, you know, would it be opening up opportunities uh, through the private sector or is it going to be some government program? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, my, the perspective I have on this, uh, this recent announcement about emissions and, and, uh, and looking at what, what's going on with coal, it, it struck me uh, that the President's under a lot of pressure to approve the Keystone Pipeline. And he's also under a lot of pressure from environmental groups. So I might be reading tea leaves on this, but I'm thinking maybe he announced this, this emissions policy 
to give himself some space to approve Keystone later this summer. Um, it's, I mean, certainly the, the policy fits within his, his view of, of, uh, of environmentalism and, and energy, but um, you know, that I, I think, I suspect he's, again, I'm reading tea leaves, he may be trying to create some space to approve the, the Keystone Pipeline because there's no, no reason not to approve it based on everything that we have out there. And I think it's important. I mean, this will help us further integrate markets. Uh, that train derailment recently highlighted the, the dangers you have in shipping oil, uh, especially through, uh, by rail, through population density areas. Um, and pipelines ultimately are the safest way to do this. Um, so um, I, that's my thought on it, but uh, I, don't, I don't know any further detail. Sarah, I don't know if you've seen any detail on what they're proposing for Africa. Yeah, so I mean, I think on both plans, I, I'm going to I'm going to be sort of apolitical here, and and uh, I genuinely believe I don't I, I don't look at this as uh, through strictly sort of like political lens as sort of the war on coal piece is, 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 uh, uh, has been sort of uh, used as a descriptor of the climate change plan. I think for for my money, I think that the Obama administration fundamentally believes that they need to do something about climate change, and they're trying to be politically pragmatic about what is possible for them to do in the time they have remaining. And I take it as genuinely as that. Uh, and so when you, when you look at what the climate change plan was that they put out, it had uh, several component pieces. One was you know, reducing emissions, and much of that comes through power sector energy efficiency regulation, and that's the part that's been deemed war on coal. Um, but this is coming from the exact same administration who, when they first came in, proposed cap and trade programs that tried to make a lot of space for coal, and nobody was calling it a war on coal then. So uh, this is a, a suboptimal solution. I, I fundamentally believe that, that folks who have looked at climate change uh, as a, a sort of reducing emissions uh, to, to combat climate change feel like this policy is not necessarily the one that anybody wanted to be the outcome, but it is the one that uh, that's possible at, at this point. I think the way that that feeds into, uh, so, so I think that the, the administration is sort of caught between a rock and a hard place, right? They wanted a, a world in which we're transitioning away from fossil-based energy sources over the next multiple decade old time frame, right? So that we can do something about climate change. Um, but at the same time, we've got this, you know, unconventional oil and gas revolution in the United States and as much coal as we've ever had. And so you have to find a way to square that circle if you believe that the economic good that comes from, you know, producing fossil-based energy sources is something that's fundamentally good for your economy, but over the long run, you don't believe it's good for the climate. That is not an easy problem to solve. And that's domestically. When you take it to like the Power Africa initiative, which is essentially, you know, there has been a, a, a predominant, uh, and we're having an event on this, uh, another program here is having an event on this here on Friday. Uh, but you look at it and it's, it, it's basically an, another question that's difficult to solve, which is how do you look at you know, providing energy resources in places where energy resources are desperately needed as part of the equation for development in a way that makes commercial sense with, again, the looming specter of, of climate change, right? I mean, this has been an ongoing debate within the developing community. Do you allow the cheapest energy sources, which are not necessarily the lowest carbon energy sources going forward, or do you promote things that are more expensive in the hope that you can jumpstart some of those things? And, and oh, by the way, how do you do all of this in a fiscally and economically challenged <laughs> environment, right? Not easy stuff. but the, but the themes that have come out of it, I think, are kind of interesting um, on the domestic side. You know, the fact that we're now talking about adaptation and science and mitigation all in the same thrust. I think that's the right direction. Um, yeah, so. You know, a lot of these points about the U.S. debate, climate change and fossil fuel, coal, is all that same, those same points are being raised within the context of India. India is going through that same debate. In fact, mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry, on his trip, uh, his major focus, if there was a major focus, was on climate change and working more closely with India on that issue. We had Vikram Mehta uh, here a couple of years ago. He was then chairman of Shell, the Shell Group in India, and he gave a major speech on uh, India's uh, energy policy and its future. And he said in that speech that he gave that uh, a key element of India's strategy is to focus on natural gas. And then he said this, natural gas is the bridge fuel mm -hmm. between our present position and our hoped for future situation 
when renewables become a more dominant part of the energy basket. So I mean, this is all of these pieces are working together, and both countries are trying to figure out how to do it, the timing, sequencing, and the rest. So we've got, um, I think, only about five more minutes. Why don't we do this? I see two hands up. Now I see four <laughs> hands up. That actually wasn't a call for more <laughs> hands when I said two <laughs> hands up. Let's let's do these two hands here. I regret to say. Uh, we'll have to stop there. If you would both ask your questions and then we'll have the Congressman and Sarah respond. Hi, I'm Colin Smith with the American Council on Renewable Energy and I wanted to return the conversation to the logistics of developing this industry on a large scale. Um, already there's some questions about or concerns that the water intensive process of hydraulic fracturing is contributing to drought in Texas. And I'm just wondering how we can balance the um, need for urgency in this situation with the desire to develop an industry in a way that will give us this energy security without sacrificing the natural resources that are also very important. And Claire Richardson Barlow, CSIS. Um, my question is actually a very good follow-up to that and a follow-up to something that you said, Ambassador. Um, I'm just wondering how social license issues are being addressed in India, if there are any, with regards to importing natural gas, the utilization of more natural gas. And Congressman, if you could also speak to addressing social license issues here in the United States as well. Thank you. Well, with the water situation, obviously, the water needed for, for hydraulic fracturing is, is a, a concern. And I know that, um, now I'm not an expert on all the technology, but I know a lot of these companies are looking at ways to, to reduce the water usage through recycling and so forth. Uh, but that's also a limitation in other countries. I mean, for instance, China, which supposedly has large uh, unconventional uh, reserves, they have a water problem. And so that's, that, that creates a limitation in, ha in how you're going to get this gas uh, out and, and ultimately to market. I think it's also a factor in Australia as well, in addition to having to build up pipelines. But the water issue is important. And um, the concern about uh, whether aquifers are, are affected, I, I think the technology is pretty well established to protect aquifers. But the water usage issue remains one of the limitations. And, and I, I believe technology over time will help to solve that. On the social license issue, I, I think, um, uh, help me with this. You asked it uh, with regard to India. Well, in the U.S., I know, uh, you know, right now the a lot of the regulations done state by state, and there are there are groups that are very concerned uh, about whether to move forward with this for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I think what, what we're seeing in some of the states, for instance, Ohio and Pennsylvania, is a shifting of opinion that this is a net positive. Uh, the key is to get the right information out and get factual information out and not, uh, you know, distorted uh, distortion of the facts that will affect uh, public opinion, you know, adversely. Um, I know the EPA has looked at all this and still hasn't gotten involved in it because they cannot find the science to verify some of the claims uh, against moving forward. So um, the key is to get the facts out more than anything. And I, I can't speak to India. I don't know the internal situation there uh, on social license. Claire, you and I will talk about this since our offices are next to each other <laughs> after the session about social licensing in India. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, just real quickly on both of those issues, they're both I exceptionally important. We spent a full mm. year talking about uh, unconventional gas development as it's being managed here in the United States, and a huge part of that conversation was around people's, people's uh, concern over the ability to do this safely, and part of that had to do with water. Now, the one thing we learned is uh, energy politics are le less complicated than water politics, right? <laughs> uh, that's something I've learned over the years of doing energy. If it's a battle between energy and water, water will win. You can't presume that the water politics and the way water resources are managed in any one part of the world or with the country are fundamentally altered by, uh, are, are one, straightforward and managed well and didn't have problems in and of themselves before 
energy production, whether it's unconventional gas or oil, or whether it's for power generation, or whether for biofuels development, right? And so it is very hard to make overarching statements about water quality and water quantity issues other than you have to manage them within the context in which you exist, right? So if you are in a water scarce area, you are probably going to have to bring technology applications to bear that help you manage that issue, whether it's recycling or waterless drilling or what. So, so part of this is trying to figure out where those places uh, that, you know, where that's a key issue. And a lot of countries around the world, the big question is, you know, w will they be able to bring those technologies to bear in a way that that's cost competitive, right? And, and or will they be using their water resources that they used to use from other, some other, you know, purpose for, uh, for, for this because they think it's more economically viable. These are questions that, you know, I think are getting worked out on a case-by-case -case basis. The, the water quality issue is a, is a whole different ball of wax, right? And I think that that's, you know, being able to make sure that you manage water resources in a way that doesn't degrade the overall all resource. And that's what a lot of the regulation that you're seeing uh, in a lot of places around the United States is focusing on. And the social license piece is, is uh, is um, the most important thing that everybody always brings up, but nobody has a very straight answer to, right? I mean, we talk about it. Every meeting I ever have dealing with unconventional oil and gas, we talk about this social license question. And, and really, I, I think one of the things that we concluded in the study that we did is social license isn't something you earn, right, and you're done. It's something you're constantly re-earning. And I think that companies who operate in environments that are close to local communities are understand that you have to sort of constantly be rewinning the public confidence about the process that you're undertaking. And I think that there's been a the the nature of how this development happened in the United States means that we had the development and the conversation about how people felt about it, right? Because local landowners were basically able to make money off the resource being developed, and then communities sort of got involved and everyone got up to speed. I don't know any other country around the world that wants to do that, right? So now what's happening is you're seeing other countries have their conversation about social license first and say, gee, do we feel like these are risks that we can take? And it's a fundamentally different process than what we had in the United States. But um, as I'm sure the congressman can uh, can attest to, uh, it, it's not uh, it's not a one-sided thing, right? I mean, people see benefits and people are worried about the concerns, and sometimes those are the same people, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, last word, congressman, do you have a final sort of takeaway message on this subject that you want to leave with the audience? Well, I think um, last word would be that we're on the verge of something new that's potentially tremendously beneficial. Uh, to both the United States and India and other countries that uh, uh, depend on energy. And the, the fact of the matter is that the United States is moving into a new area where we're now uh, potentially a net exporter of a number of types of uh, energy products. And that's a, that's a very promising development. Well, I think there's the expression sometimes overused about uh, these things being a win-win. But in this case, it is a win-win. In fact, I've mentioned several handouts. If you haven't gotten them on the way in, on your way out, please get them. Uh, one is our uh, monthly publication, the U.S. India Insight. Uh, last month it was on U.S. energy exports to India, a game changer. In fact, I think the whole energy cooperation writ large between the United States and India is a game changer for the bilateral relationship. So please take a look at those. Um, so once again, let me thank you. Uh, very much for being not only here today, but last month. You're becoming a part of the CSIS <laughs> family. Uh, you'll be invited to, you know, holiday parties now. <laughs> all right. And all, these things <laughs> all the good to, things. All the good things, but we do yeah. greatly appreciate it, Congressman. Sarah, thank you for no, co-sponsoring this with me and all of your great comments. So let's have a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Enjoyed it very much. <laughs>